Welcome back to Civil Net. I'm your host, Patrick Elliott. I'm uh, delighted to be joined today by Marika Mikiashvili, a, uh, the uh, Georgian Droa Party uh, member, researcher, and activist, uh, joining us from Tbilisi. Marika, thank you for uh, coming on today. Thank you very much for inviting me, Patrick. Hello, everyone. Um, so tell us what's uh, what's going on currently in Georgia. We're following very closely here in Armenia that uh, Tbilisi is rocked by protests, uh, especially um, given this controversial foreign agents law that uh, Georgian Dream has uh, has uh, attempted to pass, and it seems that it's about to pass uh, upon its third reading in Parliament. Tell us a little bit about this law. What's so controversial about it? Why is it being dubbed a Russian law, and so on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so. Um... Uh, just to start from the beginning a little bit, uh, they had the first attempt to introduce this law last year in March, uh, and uh, the society really gave a punch back. So when we protested and they proceeded with a crackdown, uh, then the same happened another day. Um, the resistance in the streets uh, and the response to the police brutality was really um, uh, very effective. Uh, so they backed off last year before the no to Russian law campaign could become no to Russian government. Um, the, the Georgian dream, the government, they they have done it several times when they pretend to be backtracking, but it's only a tactical backtracking and then they come back with full force again. So now they had uh, one year to prepare for everything. Um, and uh, uh, of course, we expected protests after last year's protest. Uh, we we expected that people would be protesting the law again for sure but no one could foretell the scales the um like just how massive this protest is and uh um I want to underline that this protest, it uh, destroys all stereotypes about Georgia. Tra traditionally, it's known that Georgians need a centralized leadership to protest and to rally behind a messiah or something. And also that we get very tired easily if we don't achieve our objectives in a couple of days. That's it. Like we go home. But this is extremely grassroots, extremely decentralized and self-organized uh, and also very enduring in time. And uh, um, like... It feels like the society before this protest, it, it was more or less sleeping. It really felt like we were sleeping before and now it's some sort of awakening. So for national spirit, national like confidence boost and pride, this has been extremely important. And uh, uh, this really is, uh, feels like national awakening for so many people around, I think most people around. Um, uh, so even despite the fact that the law is not revoked yet, we consider that this phase of the protest has been a remarkable success. Um, so what's wrong with the law? Uh, well, First of all, we understand that this is the law uh, from which the suffocation of civil liber liberties began in Russia. We have the terrible example of Russia, uh, where this foreign agents law was first adopted in uh, our wider region. And uh, we see where it brought Russian civil society and freedom in Russia and so on. Um, uh, I mean, from the public perception, uh, that is what, what the people see. Uh, and also that this is not the way how we proceed to the European Union and NATO, and 85% uh, of population supports European integration. Uh, and uh, we realize that this will be bringing Georgia back to the Russian orbit. And for Georgia, being back on the Russian orbit means absolute insecurity, absolute vulnerability, and basically being at Russia's mercy. And we don't really trust Russia's mercy. We never had any historical reason to trust Russian mercy. So we really feel like this is, um, if the law passes, and also if we do not get rid of the government uh, in October elections, it very much feels like we're losing independence as a nation overall. So it's not even what kind of country Georgia will be. It's like whether Georgia will exist or not exist. Um, so to go more just specifically into... I'm sorry, sorry, just on that point, I, I just want to ask you, one thing that we're having difficulty, difficulty reconciling is why is it that Georgian dream, uh, given the, the, the population, as you mentioned, 85% uh, have Euro aspirations, why is it the Georgian dream has kept winning elections? What are they doing? Is it some corruption? Is it gerrymandering? What's, why are they still in power? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so 
in 2012, they came to power just as a pro-European party. So th that was not an issue. They were not elected as a pro-Russian government. And back then, they really were a rather grand coalition of uh, many minor pro-Western parties as well. It wasn't this monolithic monster that it is today, where there is no dissenting opinion at all. Um, so it, uh, the Saakashvili government was changed for various reasons, uh, including the fact that people thought that maybe someone else could manage relationship better with Russia. But it um but the Georgian dream was not uh, elected um as an opposition to the European idea. People still believed that the uh, Georgian dream would deliver on the promise of European integration. Um, then in 2016, they were again elected because people didn't see a viable alternative in the opposition. From 2016 to 2020, they really escalated badly in terms of capturing the state and behaving autocratically. Um, and uh, they were already talks that Georgian dream is not bringing us to um, Europe, that they are actually uh, a Russian force. But the talks were, how to say, um, the society was not convinced at large and neither were Georgia's partners. Uh, so the thing is that Georgia had used to have a, a mixed parliamentary elections, which means half used to be elected proportionally and the other half with majoritarian, like single mandate seats. Uh, so in 2016, the Georgian dream, they did not get half of the votes, uh, but they got all the majoritarian seats because they were first, more popular than other parties. Second, it was easy to pressure people on the ground to like vote for majoritarians. Anyway, so with less than half of popular support, they got constitutional majority in the government. And that is the tragedy of mixed uh, systems. Uh, same happened in Hungary with Orban, by the way. Um, another thing is that Georgia is a hyper-centralized state. I'm joking usually, but it's not even a joke. It's kind of really like this, that if you want to change a light bulb somewhere in the village, you have to have a Tbilisi's permission. So uh, whoever sits in Tbilisi in the government, and they had constitutional majorities, as I said, they have all the resources to influence all levels of state administration. And third, we only have one oligarch in this country and only one person who really has independent money and who is wealthy beyond being vulnerable to any internal pressures. And that is the guy who's behind this government now, this Russian-made oligarch, Bizinei Manishvili. So these three factors, the uh, electoral system, the centralization and his limitless money, uh, especially compared to the opposition, enabled them to proceed with whatever they wanted. And elections, elections are heavily manipulated in Georgia, yes. Um, last time, I think the OSCE said that it barely passed the threshold of democracy. Um, and uh, so they use pressure, they use intimidation on personal levels, uh, also vote buying. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like... Do you want me to release your father from prison? You vote for Georgian Dream. Or the other way, you want me to plant evidence against your husband in uh, uh, somewhere and have him jailed? Um, you, will, you vote for Georgian Dream. Well, not all of the pressure and intimidation is as bad as this. Some are more carrots than sticks. For example, um, somebody has a driver's license revoked and they are restoring it earlier. Um, for them to vote for GD. They also require from people to send pictures of the voted ballot so that it's actually GD on paper. <laughs> and the GD is the Georgian dream. Anyway, yes, the elections are heavily manipulated months before election day. Um, it's not about... Uh, until now, at least, it hasn't been that much about counting as much as uh, about um, pressuring the population before. Um, well, also the lack of a viable alternative in the eyes of many people that also helped the Georgian dream to stay in power this long. Um, uh, and uh, so they began 
unmasking themselves as Russians in the eyes of the wider population, of course, the experts and some people already saw it. But for the masses of population, they began unmasking themselves as pro-Russians when Ukraine was invaded full scale in 2022. And they began having very anti-Ukrainian and anti-Western rhetoric. Um, uh, but at that point, they had already captured all state institutions. So everything is GD. Judiciary, police, I don't know what to name. <laughs> Only independent institution now is the president. And even she's uh, elected with the GD support. So she just defected, basically, we can say that. Um, and another institution which is like at least half independent but people have questions about it is the ombudsman but in any case ombudsman doesn't have any real executive power so um so yes they began unmasking themselves as russians uh and by the way um the public as well as the political class of georgia always had this false sense of security and illusion of security, especially because um, we are such a pro-Western, pro-EU population. And we could never allow the fact that any government would try to change Georgia's foreign policy. Um, so I think Georgia's political class, uh, like many opposition parties, not all, but many, they underestimated the danger coming from the Georgian dream because they thought that the overwhelming European support in the population would serve as checks and balances on the government. But it doesn't. It doesn't need because they're, they're not interested in public opinion anymore. Basically, the uh, like they are saying... I'm doing whatever you want. If you do not like it, overthrow me with a revolution if you are if you are that such a cool kind of guy or girl, right? So the so um, do you see any real risks of that in Georgia at this point? I mean, where do you see these uh, what are what are the specific demands of the protesters in Tbilisi? Is it to to withdraw that law or is it for the the government essentially to resign? Uh, yes, uh, Patrick, um, I'll answer that. But like first, I would like to really quickly go back to the uh, content of the law. So the law requires every organization that receives at least 20% of funding from abroad to label itself as foreign agent. Uh, and I want to underline that in Georgia, there is no independent money. There is no money vul uh, that wouldn't be vulnerable to state pressure and intimidation. So all businesses are afraid that if they fund CSOs or opposition parties, they'll be in big trouble. And they are right to be afraid uh, in that regard. So every community work in Georgia, all organizations in Georgia, depend on Western money to function. And this law, it concerns not just so-called political NGOs of like transparency, international or uh, like uh, the Soros Foundation or something. It concerns everything. Animal shelters, single mothers shelters, uh, organizations working for disabilities and so on. And uh, uh, also in Georgian language, the word agent means a spy and an enemy of the nation, basically. Uh, so what they're saying is that if you're receiving Western money, you're a spy, uh, which means that the West is the enemy, right? Because why would it be bad to receive Western money if the West was good? So they are flipping friends and enemies in Georgian perception. In Georgian perception, the West is not the enemy and Western money is not something to be ashamed of. Um, so that's it, uh, basically, to be very quick. But so for a year, they said it's about transparency. But then uh, even truly the oligarch himself said that the NGOs are a power in the Western hands to impose foreign rule. That's it. So he wants to do a big crackdown on NGOs. As for our demands, uh, yeah, the no to Russian law, of course, very quickly became no to Russian government. This is not about, just about the law. The law is the slogan. Uh, the movement is against the government at this point and has been for a long time already. Um, however, now we are at the critical juncture when we need political channeling of the protests. The uh, anger and the everything needs to be channeled into support for political parties uh, so that when we get to elections in October, and hopefully we get there at all, um, yes, we the Georgian dream is... Um, really defeated at the polls. Um, it's hard to tell what happens or whether they conduct normal elections at all or whether they like 
enable the country to physically get to elections uh, and don't make the life absolutely impossible this last uh, five months. Uh, but yes, now it's time for political parties to stand up and come on the front line and people are expecting that. Uh, and let's see how it goes. It's extremely problematic, but I really hope that the uh, that everyone realizes the existential threat we are facing and they will step up. Uh, so what uh, what lessons can Armenia learn uh, from what's going on in Georgia, especially given uh, Armenia's current um, geopolitical realignment? Yes, after 2018, but much more openly now after uh, 2021, that we're very clearly moving towards uh, European integration with, with Euro aspirations. Um, how is this going to impact Armenia, right? Georgia is essentially our gateway to the outside world. Exactly. I think the first country that uh, would be affected by Georgia's uh, foreign agents law and Georgia falling back on the Russian orbit essentially is uh, Armenia. Well, other than Georgia, it's Armenia. And I think it's an existential threat for every Armenian who believes in democracy and freedom and for whom it's uh, not the same whether they live under Russian uh, state terrorist corrupt system or uh, in a free society. So, uh, uh, so yes, Georgia is the country that physically connects Armenia with the Western world, and not and not just the Western world, but to a degree like the outside world. Um, and uh, it would be suffocating everything in Armenia. Uh, it's it's really concerning. Uh, especially, it's very tragic for me to see that Armenia now tries to be a democratic state and a free society, and um, there is a, a lot of development in that regard. But it is so unlucky to have the Georgian dream as a government in Georgia because it's a huge impediment for Armenia right now. Um, and uh, I've been saying this for ages that. Uh, uh, Armenians, whoever they can, and especially Armenian diaspora, I think they really should put efforts into um, uh, like making pressure on the local governments uh, so wherever they live to um, impose sanctions and travel bans on Georgian Dream because uh, because this directly affects Armenia's future. Um, and uh, also to maybe to spread the word in international media about what's happening in Georgia, as well as Armenian media. Uh, how does Georgian civil society view uh, Armenia's developments post uh, the Velvet Revolution of 2018 and more specifically now in our, our very uh, obvious pivot away from Russia? Like, what's the feeling up in uh, in Tbilisi or, or in broader Georgia among civil society members? Among civil society members, so those people who are more or less aware of what's happening in the region and Armenia, uh, they are, um, yes, uh, extremely happy about Armenia's recent drift away from Russia and uh, uh, very happy about um, uh, democratization and uh, freedoms in Armenia. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, like there's a stereotype that Georgians and Armenians are, are rivals <laughs> historically. Uh, I would say that recent developments in Armenia in uh, positive developments in democratization and uh, like um, uh, drifting away from Russia. Um, so it's definitely affecting the generations and younger generations very positively towards Armenia. Um, and I also think that uh, in Armenia, there's also uh, much less rivalry towards Georgia, uh, and uh, I, and there is a more sense of solidarity lately in the, between our two countries. That's what I perceive, at least. For example, I remember when Georgia qualified for Euro 2024, uh, there were so many, so many comments of congratulations and the encouragement from Armenians. Um, uh, I, I think even 10 years ago, that would not have been fully the case. Not so many people would be... Um, cheering for each other's well-being in uh, Georgia and Armenia, I think. And uh, it is very, very uh, encouraging and uh, for me to see how we are overcoming the old Soviet stereotypes and uh, understanding that we need each other and we need to be in full solidarity with each other. Um, yes, and uh, in Georgia, uh, so uh, last year, no, two years ago, Olaf Scholz said that Europe from Lisbon to Tbilisi but then some members of Georgian civil society um, changed it to uh, Europe from Lisbon to Yerevan, uh, observing Armenia's latest policies. And, and right now, Armenia really has been some sort of a hope 
for Georgians as well. Um, it's very encouraging to see uh, another country in the region who is also aspiring for freedoms and democracy. Um, and especially these days, uh, yes, uh, it's... Um, it's, it's an additional hope in the sense that maybe the West will not abandon Georgia also because abandoning Georgia means uh, failing all projects in Armenia and just failing Armenia altogether. So Armenia is a factor now, is an additional hope for Georgian resistance, yes. Well, Marika, I, I, I hope that uh, someday soon uh, Georgians will be toasting uh, with Khacheti wine and Armenians without any wine to our... Uh... Uh, brighter futures. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Gmatlop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for watching. This has been Pat from Civilnet, and we'll catch you very soon.